My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning and today we are going to tackle the conundrum Are tourists safe in Europe? There is a war between Iran via its proxies Hamas and Hezbollah and Israel and it is only a question of time before this war hits the shores of Europe. Expect major terrorist attacks in cities across the continent imminently. Now here's the thing, Isolate, isolated, intermittent terror attacks have no long-term effects on destination tourism. Only a prolonged period of civil unrest and warfare can decimate a country's inbound tourism. Facing a variety of threats has always been an integral part of the job description of a tourist. So an incident here an attack there don't change tourism patterns in the long run. Nowadays, as tourists embark on their annual vacances post-pandemic, tourists are mentally prepared to cope with a panoply of risks and dangers. International terrorism, domestic terrorism and insurgencies, blended terrorism, domestic malcontents inspired by international ones, crime, of course, Anything from pickpockets and panhandlers to muggers, kidnappers, the homeless, unsolicited prostitution, you name it. There's also the risk attendant on inadvertently violating social and cultural mores, norms, customs and laws in the host country. There's endemic diseases. There are other health hazards, anything from food poisoning to food allergies. Encounters with indigenous predatory or venomous fauna and flora, and so on. Their natural disasters and their economic disruptions, such as strikes in airports. Nowadays, tourists are far more versed at adopting precautions and impl implementing preventive measures. We tend to forget, though, that tourists not only fall victim to mishaps and delinquency, they are also vectors of threats. Tourists are often zero patients in the spread of contagion and pandemics, as we have learned. Terrorists, narco-dealers and intelligence officers frequently pose as tourists to gain safe passage to their targets. Some tourists constitute a threat to other tourists, owing to their nationality, Israelis, for example, Americans, or owing to their misconduct and inappropriate behavior. Rage attacks on airplanes come to mind. After the 9-11 terrorist attacks, there has been an imperceptible move away from vacation to staycation, spending one, one's days off at home. More broadly, there's been a shift to domestic tourism. Abroad, tourists are tempting soft targets for criminals and terrorists, both homegrown and international, often greeted by xenophobia and rabid stereotypes, tourists cannot rely on suspicious local law enforcement or on the hostile populace to come to their aid or to not abet and aid their persecutors. The starburst model of asymmetrical warfare seeks to strike against multiple nationalities in a single operation carried out with minimal assets and means. It is part and parcel of the concept of total war, which makes no distinction between combatants and civilians. The Hamas attacks on October 7 were such an attack, constituted a starburst attack. A tourist resort is therefore an ideal target. It is also impossible to enhance the resilience of such soft targets by fortifying them, because this would counteract and conflict with the openness and freedom which are an essential part of the experience of tourism. Truly defending against terrorist attacks would require the conversion of hotels into prisons, the transformation of tourists' numbered holidays into an anxiety-ridden, worry-filled, nightmarish sojourn. It is self-defeating. Security planners would do well to emulate the lessons learned in information technology defenses. Establish a comprehensive, 
hard to penetrate perimeter, a firewall, multi-layered, distributed as well as concentric intrusion detection systems, intelligence-driven protection akin to signature-based antivirus anti-malware anti products, biometric and face recognition defenses, systems founded on heuristic behavioral and telltale signs, coping with insider threat, hotel personnel, tour guides recruited by terrorist organizations or by crime rings, for example, compartmentalization and backup zones similar to the architecture typical of ocean liners, and dynamic proactive protection and surveillance of paths, routes, marketplaces, downtown city centers, hubs, transportation, events, and so on. It is clear that passive deterrence, for example, CCTV, is not enough. It should go hand in hand with preventive and preemptive measures, education, preparedness, and active deterrence, for example, a pronounced, advertised, and visible police presence. Even fences are not good enough, as Israel has learned to its detriment. A customer-friendly, <clears throat> specially trained tourism police integrated with various suppliers and providers in the tourism industry, could go a long way towards ameliorating and countering persistent threats to tourism. Simple maintenance has been proven to reduce crime dramatically. Street lighting, hedge pruning, sanitary measures, homeless shelters, needle exchanges, and so on. Organized tours should also incorporate one or more security guards. Tourist education is critical. Cultural sensitivity training, introduction to the legal system in the destination and to specific relevant laws, the role, functions and limitations of the diplomatic missions in situ, safety and security measures and behaviors, and lists of useful and emergency contacts, including medical personnel and lawyers and translators. Tourist attractions, accommodation and services should be ranked for security and safety, possibly via crowdsourcing similar to the comparative information provided by TripAdvisor.com. Tourism is a complex operation. It's actually a form of export. And as we impose restrictions, limitations, as we regulate other types of exports, we need to do so with tourism as well. The safety of everyone involved. 